Good afternoon. Thank you very much. We have these issues with technology. Welcome to hearing number three of the 180 period of sessions. The title of this hearing is Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Honduras. It has been requested by the following organizations, Center for Reproductive Rights, Center for the Rights of Women, the Juridical Team for Human Rights, and Somos Muchas. I would like to thank the organizations and I would like to thank the state for being at this hearing. My name is Julissa Manticha Falcón. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Today with me are the rapporteur, Commissioner uh, Joel Hernandez and also Commissioner May Macaulay that is the rapporteur for women's rights and also Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena that is the Commissioner Rapporteur for the Rights of Children. Also the Secretary of Monitoring, Maria Claudia Pulido, and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad García Muñoz, are here. We will have 10 minutes for the civil society, then we will have another 20 minutes for the state, and after that, the commission will take its time and then we will have a second round. The civil society will have 10 minutes and the state will have another 10 minutes. We would like to let you know that we have a digital clock on the platform and we are measuring the time of the parties. The team of the executive secretariat will be controlling the time. We also have simultaneous interpretation and we have also closed caption and we are streaming the hearing on social network and that the hearing will be uploaded to the channel, uh, the YouTube channel of the Inter-American Commission. Please turn on your cameras and mute yourselves when you are not participating. So we will start the hearing and I would like to give the floor for to the civil society organizations. Thank you. My name is Catherine Pineda. I'm a lawyer of the Equipo Jurídico por los Derechos Humanos of Honduras. Can you hear me? Gracias. We can hear you well, Katy. I would like to start saying by thanking on behalf of the participating organizations, we would like to thank Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, and Commissioners Flavia Piovesan and Julissa Mantilla, who are here with us today because of the opportunity they have granted us to present information regarding the serious situation of sexual and reproductive rights in Honduras. I also would like to uh, greet the executive secretary of the commission, the high commissioner of the United Nations for uh, refugees and also for human rights and also all the persons that are here today. We would like to talk about the serious situations of sexual and reproductive rights of girls and women in Honduras. And this is affected by the constitutional reform of the Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic. Even though that Honduras had one of the most restrictive systems regarding the access to sexual and reproductive rights for women, and abortion was fully sanctioned in October this uh, last year, the president of the Constitutional Assembly presented a, a law that implied the reform of Article 77 that had to do with the right to life. The goal of the reform is to reaffirm the respect for life of those unborn in order to prevent the practice of abortion since they consider that this practice is against human nature. The reform also implies making uh, pro or prohibiting abortion at the constitutional level. And therefore, three quarters of the National Congress should approve this reform when um, the, the regulation was changed. So uh, instead of two thirds of the Congress, uh, three quarters of the Congress were required to approve the reform. And therefore the Congress approved and ratified in 2021, the constitutional reform of article 67. The process of reform was done 
very quickly. And the three uh, public debates were suspended or interrupted, and there was no broad debate on the issue. And civil society organizations were not invited to participate, especially those organizations that work in the defense of reproductive and sexual rights. And women were not able to participate in the reform. The reform is against international obligations of the state of Honduras to guarantee and to protect without discrimination human rights and to guarantee the full exercise of economic, social, cultural, educational, scientific, and cultural rights, such as the rights or the sexual and reproductive rights of women, girls, and adolescents. This is very important because the constitutional reform is a regressive measure. And Honduras, as a state party to the American Convention, has the international obligation to adopt measures for the full enjoyment of human rights, but also it has the obligation to avoid regressive measures. With this constitutional reform, Honduras has taken a regressive measure, which was based on a, an explanation that is no longer valid at an international level because there is no full protection to the right to life of those unborn. And the constitutional reform is worsening the situation of criminalization of girls, adolescents, and women who have access to these services in Honduras. Therefore, Honduras is not complying with the Article 26 of the American Convention and is preventing women from having access to the service of abortion in any circumstances, even when there is a risk to the health of the gestating person in the, or when there is a sexual violation. Even though the reform was not necessary, um, this creates a negative uh, impact on the exercise of rights of women, adolescents, and girls. This also worsens the stigmatization of women and creates also more fear with regard to these services of abortion and will lead to an increase in the number of illegal abortions. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Erika Garcia. Good afternoon, I am Erika Garcia. We would like to say hi also to Commissioner Esmeralda Arosemena. I would like to talk about the serious situation regarding the denial of reproductive and sexual rights in Honduras. Honduras is one of the six countries that sanctions abortions in any circumstances without giving a legal framework based on causes. Articles uh, uh, the article of the criminal code that was passed last year defines abortion as the death of any human being at any time of the pregnancy. And the sanctions go to from three to six years of prison. And there are also the judicialization of women who arrive to public hospitals because of an emergency in their pregnancies. Also, the state of Honduras has opposed for 12 years the ministerial agreement of 2009 that also prohibits uh, emergency pills. And they say that those pills are an abortion method. In spite of the fact that the WHO has reiterated several times that these pills prevent pregnancy and do not cause abortion. And also the WHO has said that emergency pills should be part of the health services, especially for those groups that could suffer sexual violations without protection, especially those victims of sexual harassment or aggression. Also, um, the, in spite of the over 4,000 cases of sexual violence against girls and adolescents, uh, recorded recently, the state decided to derogate or to eliminate that ministerial agreement. And therefore they are saying that the lives of women are less important than uh, the product of a pregnancy. And therefore the value of that potential human being should not be over the life of a 
human being that has been already born, that is to say, the woman or the girl. The state needs to guarantee the principle of dignity. There are several complaints against the state of Honduras because of those measures that prevent access to reproductive health, including the legalization of abortion, at least in cases of violations on whether there is a threat to the life of the pregnant women, woman or girl. This honorable commission in 2019 recalled that the criminalization of abortion by uh, putting a burden on the rights of women goes against international obligations of states to guarantee human rights and women's rights, especially those related to integrity and to health. Also, the commission recalled Honduras that it should adopt policies and legislation in order to guarantee and overcome any barriers regarding the full exercise of reproductive and sexual rights of women, girls, and adolescents. However, the state of, of Honduras is violating sexual and reproductive rights of women in Honduras and continues to violate those rights. And this situation is getting worse and worse because there is no comprehensive sexual education at schools. There is no emergency contraception for women. Abortion is sanctioned and now at a constitutional level. And women who reach the hospitals because of obstetric, obstetric emergencies are uh, being criminalized as well. And this is also worsened by the levels of violence against women and girls even, and this did not stop during the pandemic. In 2020, the observatory and the Center for Women docu documented almost 300 cases of feminicide. And in 2021, 82 cases of feminicide have been recorded. Every three hours, a girl or a woman have suffered uh, sexual violence. In most of the cases, the victims are children between 10 and 19 years old. Taking into consideration this, the state has not been able to approve a protocol for attention of the victims of sexual violence, which was, which um, the project was prepared by a committee of experts and was granted to the authorities of the Secretariat of Health in October 2017. Taking into consideration what has been exposed, we could say that the legislation of Honduras is one of the most restrictive ones in terms of sexual and reproductive rights. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Erika and Nisa Medina from the platform Somos Muchas, and we are going to introduce the great, the serious consequences this brings to the integrity and life of women in Honduras, criminalization, forced pregnancies, and poverty. The Honduran states have used the judicial systems to condemn women who try to access these systems, such as abort. A study about the criminalization of 67 women concluded that all criminalized women have faced great levels of stigma, and this is reflected, among other injustices, by the percentage of the use of preventive um, detention, the fundamentalism, and this shows a persecution against uh, women who are denounced or reported. 64% of the criminalized women in the report was made, the denounced by, was made by the uh, Ministry of Health against the medical secrecy and women went to the center for pregnancies and even many times before giving them medical attention and without proving whether this was a spontaneous abortion or not, they we are accompanying a woman who was criminalized after getting to the hospital, after an obstetric emergency who caused the abortion and she was expulsed from the hospital and she, there was 11 years in, in which she could not be just to get justice. She was condemned by the community. She couldn't get a work. She had to go week after week to the court to sign a book that she hadn't run from the country. 
decriminalization of abortion doesn't reduce the need of women to access to these methods, but they have to turn to unsafe alternatives and they have to face 50,000 and 80,000 endurance and in a country where the more, uh, mother's mortality rates is really high. With the complete criminalization of abortions, there was not uh, one forced uh, pregnancy that was avoided in Honduras. The risk for children is higher than adult women, and this is the main cause of death of the girls between 15 and 19 years old in the world. One out of four Honduran girls was pregnant, at least one before turning 19, and there are 30,000 uh, born birth of of uh, children in girls between 15 and 19 years old and some of them are the product of violations and as it has been defined by the convention Belén do Pará the pregnancy of a girl of less than 14 years old has to be considered non-consented and this has to be considered a sexual violation between girls between 10 and 14 years, there are lots of girls and we fear that due to the pandemic, this, there has been an increase in these numbers, such as the case of a girl 10 years old from Tehuateca in Honduras who had a, uh, a surgery because she had to, uh, she was pregnant because of her father-in-law and they have very serious psychological da damages, anxiety, suicide, and suicide is associated with uh, pregnant, uh, with pregnancy in adolescence. This influence in the characteristic of children. They are forced to abandon their studies, and they have to dedicate to uh, care work and they have more possibilities of being unemployed or uh, employed in informal employment. This is not only product of the context of gender violence and sexual violence in Honduras, this is the result of a state that tries to put, to put hindrance for sexual and reproductive rights. They pose at risk the life of girls and women, and they do not comply with the rights they they com committed themselves to comply with before this commission. All of us, we all need dignified and healthy lives. I will give the floor to my colleague, Cal Catalina Martinez. Thank you, Nisa. I am Catalina Martinez from the Center for Reproductive Rights, and I'm going to close our intervention with certain conclusions and certain recommendations. All throughout these hearings, we could heard how the concerning situation of sexual and reproductive rights in Honduras, where there also was one of the most restrictive contexts about sexual and reproductive rights in the world in the world, and this has been worsened by the constitutional reform to Article 67 of the Constitution, which creates a blockage against abortion services. As my colleague said, this is contrary to women and girls' fundamental rights, and it will have serious consequences on their lives, health and integrity, since on the one hand, in the same way that this does not avoid um, helping uh, women to avoid to get to abortion, the inclusion of an absolute pro prohibition in the constitution won't avoid um, abortions to happen. But these, they have to be, they have to be carried out in unsafe com conditions, and this increases. Uh, health and uh, mortality rates of mothers in the country. On the other hand, there is an impossibility to modify any future le legislation according to the standard international rights on sexual and reproductive rights, and it reinforces the collective imaginarium of criminalization in a essential service as it is the abortion. The Honduran state is condemning now and in the future 
women and girls in Honduras to situations that jeopardize their life through forced pregnancies or because they have to be forced to look for unsafe alternatives so as to um, finish with an unwanted pregnancy. As my colleague said, this will have an impact, disproportionate impact in the most vulnerable and marginalized populations, such as indigenous, rural women, or women that come from um, lower classes and those that are uh, that survive social uh, domestic violence. This will. This is in a country where there, there is a very high level of poverty and it's a country that is facing a very serious crisis due to the COVID crisis and the hurricanes. Finally, we think it's very important to, to say that this reform is a very serious precedent, not only for Honduras, but the, for the whole region where we are, we are already seeing, and this commission has already announced an erosion of democratic processes, because this reform constitutes an attempt against these warranties. In order to close our intervention, we believe it's urgent and essential for this commission to uh, pronounce publicly on this situation and to call upon the Honduran states that according to the conventionality principle and the standards on sexual and reproductive rights to uh, do away with the reform of Article 67 to the Constitution and to recognize that sexual and reproductive rights services are essential services. Therefore, Honduras not only does have to uh, allocate all the services so that people can access them, but they have to warranty them in a progressive way. And they have to abstain from taking regressive measures such as the reform we already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so the civil society organization has already concluded. We will take note of the time because you had some minutes left. I'm going to give the floor now to the representatives of the states. You have 20 minutes. Honorable members of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, distinguished representatives and the public in general, the Honduran states would like to greet you to this hearing whose uh, title is Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Honduras. I am here with the Office of the Prosecutor, the National Institute of Women, the Secretary of the States, and the Offices of Human Rights, Development, and Inclusion, and Social um, Health. The intervention of the Honduran state will expose on the following topics. The sexual and reproductive health, the obligation as to the sexual and reproductive rights of women and girls, judicial proceedings and the challenges. Honorable commissioners, the state of Honduras in compliance with the international uh, obligations that issue from the conventions, maintains an open policy for the protection of human rights. We do value the spaces promoted by international organizations, which allow us to interact with the different sectors for the promotion and defense of human rights, such as Recently, in the virtual conversation through when the from the peer, period from in May, where we had a very frank dialogue, an open dialogue as to the situation of human rights of the Honduran population, the state assumed the commitment to implement through the monitoring system of recommendation of Honduras Imore the recommendations. Um, created in this uh, universal 
revision cycle as to uh, violations uh, and gender vi uh, gender violence, the constitutional framework. These recommendations constitute a guide and put in place the parameters to design public policies plans and programs and projects that warranty the promotion of human rights in Honduras. In this hearing, the institution that integrates the state will inform on the circumstances, advances on the topics that have already been named before, starting with the Secretary of State in the Office of Human Rights, Jacqueline Blanchetta, and we will go on with the following representatives of the delegation. It is very important to express that even though in on January 21, 2021, the Congress through the resolution 122 reform the article 112 of the republic as to abortion and uh, equal marriage the two projects were two bills were passed for the paternity and maternity responsible paternity and maternity apart from that in the National Congress of the Republic, there are two bills, one for the protection of um, adolescents and the other one about integral education, sexual education. It is important to say that the Supreme Court of Justice has a constitutional control as the interpreter of the Constitution for the protection of human rights and the defense of the legal order. And within its scope, this court, this room knows about four uh, remedies that were, uh, that were filed against the legislative decree 122, uh, which reforms Article 67 of the Constitution, and the decree 130, which refers to the criminal code that establishes the promotion of the abortion. These are following the proceedings of law. So before the national jurisdiction, there are uh, some remedies that are to be resolved by this body. As to the ministerial agreement to 2744 of 2009, which prohibits the use and, and purchase of emergency pills, the estate reports that in 2019, there was a motion to request the executive Ranch to do away with such ministerial agreements so as to update the uh, legal framework so as to, to allow for the free distribution for women and children who have been uh, victims of sexual violence such as an option so as to avoid an unwanted pregnancy against the prohibition of contraception emergency pills no remedy has been presented before the competent bodies we recognize that there are a lot of challenges that should be overcome in the area of sexual and reproductive health however taking into consideration the need to strengthen the mechanisms of protection of human rights within the framework of the uh, the framework of constitutionality and conventionality, we believe that these spaces, such as the hearings before the IACHR, promote dialogue and interaction between the government and social sectors. And they are a tool to continue or to choose the right mechanism 
to be able to comply with those conventional obligations such as those mentioned in the uh, San Jose protocol and also in establishing article one and two and also to guarantee the protection and promotion of human rights. Now I would like to give the floor to the Under Secretary of Human Rights, Lawyer Franche. Honorable commissioners, representatives of organizations of civil society and representatives of the delegation of the government of Honduras. Good morning. The Secretariat of Human Rights that governs the preparation of protocols before international organizations within our jurisdiction, we promote the follow-up of the recommendations through the Honduras CIMORE and Inter-American CIMORE. And as a result, every, uh, we regularly monitor the recommendations presented, presented by the commission after the local visit conducted in 2018. We have recommendation 14 and 16 that have to do with sexual and reproductive rights. The state has made progress by granting before the commission uh, a specific value to the recommendation 14, which has been partially complied, and the six, recommendation 16 has also been partially complied with, taking into consideration international mechanisms of human rights. On May the 20, we had a promotional visit that was conducted virtually or online in May this year, and the three powers of the state work in this uh, visit. This was a great opportunity to establish an open and honest dialogue with public servants to show the challenges to guarantee human rights of women and girls. Also, Honduras, in compliance with, in compliance with its international commitments, received also a working visit from a group of San Salvador and that visit also covered those uh, sexual and reproductive rights. The Honduras, uh, Honduras decided to comply with those rights and to advance on the protection of human rights. With regard to the universal system, Honduras presented its universal periodical review evaluation. It received several recommendations and over um, we have five recommendations that had to do with, uh, with sexual and reproductive rights, especially those that had a high level of uh, lack of compliance. And this requires some regulations reforms. It is important to mention that the state did not reject any of those recommendations. It is also important to say that in compliance with its commitment, the state presented its nine periodical report before uh, international organizations. And we will continue to promote a culture of accountability and transparency in the area of human rights. And this has positioned us as one of the 30 countries out of 193 that do not have to present any other report on human rights because they present all of them on, in time. And the, um, the state has worked and made a lot of efforts to cooperate internationally and to work with other organizations, especially those of civil society, to promote human rights. This cooperation should continue in order to face the new challenges posed by the pandemic of COVID-19. We would like to reiterate our commitment to continue promoting um, uh, encouraging those recommendations in our policies and programs and the measures that are executed through public institutions. In order to continue with our intervention, I would like to give the floor to the Minister of the Institute, National Institute of Women. Honorable members of the Commission, representatives of civil society, good afternoon, everybody. With the goal of creating a structural impact, the state of Honduras has 
adopted a policy of prevention in order to guarantee sexual and reproductive rights. The Institute, as one of the leaders of the plan of gender equality in order to guarantee the full exercise of um, sexual and reproductive rights of girls and women has implemented the following measures, elimination of stereotypes, taboos, attitudes and behaviors that are damaging to reproductive and sexual health. Also, we have this is done, a we have a community program that offers education for uh, teenagers in the area of human rights of women. This community program also includes preventive programs uh, that are called SASA and Abriendo Oportunidades. This program is aimed at mothers and fathers and also adolescents. In addition, the Institute implements processes to promote positive cultural regulations among adolescents, everything that has to do with gender equality, violence against women, and reproductive and sexual health, and the economic autonomy of women. Since 2017 to now, over 20,000 uh, programs have been conducted, affecting 85% of the women of Honduras. We have also the School of Women of the Institute. Also, we have a virtual platform that tries to promote gender equality through proposals and pedagogical models that help develop continuous um, educational uh, processes. The, we also prepare the guidelines to guarantee the attention of pregnant women. And this includes delivery and the breastfeeding, especially also with some specific guidelines for COVID-19 patients in the public and the private sector. Through the program Ciudad Mujer, we are trying to consolidate the policy for women at a national level through articulated services. We provide access to reproductive and sexual health services and we provide attention to detect uh, different types of cancer that affect women and also to prevent unwanted pregnancies and over 290,000 services have been provided in within this framework also we provide training sessions for adolescents and also uh, therapy services and we have provided 58,000 services and regarding another program, we're also providing on-site services to help those women that have suffered sexual violence and over 55,000 services have been provided. Another program that is located in most of the most important cities of the country, we have provided 1.2 million uh, services to this uh, women. And also we have a digital platform, Conecta, that provides in uh, for free services of uh, psychological help and social work and legal, legal advice to women that suffer any form of violence. We have a website and there is a team of psycholog psychologists, lawyers and social workers that belong to the team that uh, conducts or that manages this program. And this also strengthens the state uh, capabilities. We have also implemented campaigns and we have published educational materials uh, aimed at preventing teenage pregnancy and the use of family planning methods and also attention of ITS. Also elimination of children's marriage. There is an article that eliminates children's marriage and this promotes the human rights of girls. The National Observatory of Gender that was created in 2020 and it implements the first phase of the Observatory of Gender in order to create systematic and quality information regarding women's situations, especially everything that has to do with challenges in the area of gender equality. It also collects information, analyzes 30 indicators regarding women. It's also important to mention that we are facing several challenges and barriers, and therefore we continue to work 
and we know that we will make progress in order to comply with international commitments ratified by the state of Honduras. Thank you very much. Thank you, the representatives of the state. They are, they are telling me that Isabel Albaladejo, the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations in Honduras, is with us. Yes, good morning. I'm here. Well, I wanted to introduce you to the representative of the High Commissioner of Human Rights for Honduras. Pleasure, Isabel. Thank you for being here. You have seven minutes for your presentation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, honorable commissioners, distinguished delegates. I have the honor to address to you so as to thank you for the opportunity given me for this office to take part in this hearing and the trust of the petitioners. My contribution is in is as representative in Honduras of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations and without being under sworn. So no, no, nothing expressed here has to be a waiver of the privileges and immunities of the United Nations by virtue of the Convention of 1946. Our office express its concern by the for the regressions for sexual and reproductive women uh, rights of women in Honduras. This is in a context of gender violence with a, an average of one uh, homicide per day. We reiterate our concern for the approval in January of the reform that in includes the prohibition of abortion. This may deepens the uh, regulations that were already existent, such as the um, prohibition of abortion and the use of uh, pills, emergency pills. I would like to depend about these three aspects. First, the prohibition of abortion in the Republic, the Congress approved in January 2021, the reform that incorporates in the Article 67, the prohibition of abortion, and it added as a reform mechanism, the qualified majority of three fourths of the Congress. Is, this is to say that it's a more complex process than to reform the rest of the, of the regulations. Therefore, abortion is prohibited in all its modalities and they force women to resort to unfaith alternatives and it increases the, the condition of inequality and discrimination. In the process of discussion of the reform, the National Congress did not carry out the hearings with the different sectors of the civil society and especially with women organizations. In the pre presentation of the bill and after the publication, there were only 19 days and this is not enough time so that a reform that is so important that affects so many people to be consulted properly. There are two in Constitution in this constitutionally proceedings against this reform because it vulnerates several constitutional rights and this was in this sense the office in Honduras calls upon the state to revise this reform warrant the sexual and reproductive rights of the Honduran women. Now I'm going to refer to the criminalization of abortion in all its circumstances. In August 2020, there was a new criminal code in Honduras during its discussion. Our office called upon the legislators so that abortion was allowed in at least in three circumstances. When the life of women is at risk, when there is a violation, and when there is an incompatibility between the uh, life of the women and the life of the unborn. The Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in Honduras 
have reiterated that this constitutes a very uh, a, a risk for the life of women. And we remind the state that abortion is public health and it requires an integral treatment with sexual and reproductive rights. I would like to insist that this absolute prohibition affects women in situation of vulnerability and economic poverty, rural women or marginalized women as the is indicated by our records. Among these cases, I would like to outstand the case of a woman for with against whom a proceeding was opened during 11 years and now in April the she she was absolved. And in the to the third matter I'm going to refer is to the emergency bills. Our office expressed its concerns for the fact that Honduras has one of the highest tolls uh, rates of uh, pregnancies, and there are 101 cases per uh, 1,000 women, and this figure is stable during the, during the last few years. Having children or not and when to do it is a fundamental right of women and a way to warranty this is to put at the disposal of women and contraception methods so that they can avoid unwanted pregnancies. The emergency pill is a anti-conception contraception method so as to avoid pregnancy after um, a, a protected uh, pregnancy, an unprotected pregnancy. In this, the Secretary of Health prohibited the use and purchase of the emergency bill. This placed them in an unprotected position for women who do not want to be pregnant and they cannot practice safe abortion. Apart from that, in Honduras, there are high rates of sexual violence. The main victims of sexual violence are uh, children underage, and it is very worrying the situation of girls under 14 years old whose pregnancy is presumed as a sexual violation. In between January and October 2020, the Forensic Office carried out an, an assessment on girls for sexual crimes. Therefore, the office called upon Honduras to eliminate the ministerial agreement to prohibit the pill so as to warranty the protection of the victims of sexual violence. In our office, we reaffirm our willingness to keep on working with the Honduran authorities and with the civil society organizations and the holders of rights so as to support the respect of sexual and reproductive rights based on the principles of equality and non-discrimination and the reproductive and autonomous uh, rights of women. Thank you very much, Mrs. Abadejo. Now we are going to pass on to the commissioner. I'm going to give the floor first to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Madam President. I'm going to uh, greet the organizations who requested this hearing, the representation of the state and Isabel Abadejo. For me, it's an honor to be present in this hearing, which is so important due to the magnitude of this topic. As it was said in the presentation by the civil society, the uh, topic of sexual and reproductive rights in Honduras was addressed in February 2019 in Sucre. At that time, I was already the country reporter for Andoras, and in that occasion, we had the opportunity to make an exchange of ideas regarding this topic. The truth is that the commission was um, surprised, as many other stakeholders, by this uh, fast amendment and reform. And that's what I'm going to 
call my attention to. Because even though the legal situation does not change materially, there is still the prohibition of abortion in cases of violation of sexual violence and it keeps on prohibiting the use of the emergency pill. The truth is that sending a prohibition to the highest level requires a proceeding which has to be talked through, which has to be widely debated as it should be in all democracies. A decision of this kind obliges us to have open parliament, open social forum with the participation of the civil society, but also the participation of experts, international experts, so that everyone can weigh the consequences. So that's what calls my attention. The um, how fast this measure was taken and to place this prohibition at a constitutional level. The truth is that it leaves all the possibilities close so as to advance towards the need to legalize the abortion in cases of emergency as here was previously expressed. We have been informed in this hearing about inconstitutionality actions. Mrs. Sabanejo has mentioned the requests that we have made, but which are the possibilities for a constitutional realm when this prohibition is in the constitution? I would expect that the constitutional office carries out a true constitutional control so as to go beyond the constitutional text and look at this topic based on the international obligations that were freely assumed by the Honduran states. And why do I say this? Because I agree with what the state has expressed. Undoubtedly, Honduras is a state that was that is open to international scrutiny. I had the opportunity to work together with the social the civil society, with the Honduran states, and I do celebrate this open dialogue that you are always willing to have and this openness that you have had to the commission and to other mechanisms that have been uh, addressed here. I think that what the subsecretary Ancheta says is really representative as to the high level of response that the Honduran states give to the reports of the United Nations mechanisms. And the same happens to with the um, information request that the commission requests. And there are also great advances in Honduras, such as the creation of a Simore, which precisely has, have, has had the purpose to systematize the recommendation of uh, the recommendations of the international organizations. But this commitment in favor of international standard has to go beyond the executive branch. It has to be materialized in the state in the whole. And I believe that in all democracies, the branches have to interact. So that is why my respectful invitation to the authorities here present, but also to other um, public authorities who are here, I would like you to dialogue with the con with Congress, with the judicial branch as well, and to be able to convey the international concern, not only by the Inter-American Commission, by, but by other organizations as to this matter. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't 
uh, want to express much more as to the emergency in reversing these this situation, there is a very serious situation due to the high number of reports of gender violent violence and the high number of death due to clandestine abortions and the uh, child marriage, which is 10%. These are, these are rates that are really worrying. And I think that a measure that matches today reality has to do with allowing abortion in cases of sexual violence. I think that that should be the starting point. Mrs. Alvaradejo has mentioned the recommendation of of the, the assumptions, but I would start by the most urgent aspect, which is to allow the abortion in cases of emergency and in cases of violations. And we should go a step forward, which is to allow the use of the emergency pill and facilitate its use as well. We have written down the advances you have made in other areas, uh, the law that banishes um, child marriage, other measures on education that were explained by the representatives of the state and other uh, areas or other policies attending to women. But here's a pending topic that has to be addressed. That's my call. I respectfully call you to advance so as and so as to grant a better protection for women and girls in their countries. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner May Macaulay. Thank you, Madam First Vice President. Um, good afternoon, the, um, all the representatives of civil society, the re requesters of this hearing, and with my very good afternoon as well to the, all the representatives of the state of Honduras. Um, and if I may start by saying that I support and adopt of what my brother Commissioner Joel Hernandez has just said, um, a, a complete agreement with that. And one thing which he highlighted, and I must highlight, is that after our report, the situation of human rights in Honduras of 2019, in which we dealt with our concern in this area, uh, um, on the high rates of child and adolescent pregnancies in the country of, of sexual violations, maternal deaths, so on, all in this area. It was an extreme shock for this amendment of the constitution to be done in the first place and to be embedded in the constitution with the special procedures for amendments. It was an absolute shock. It was, in fact, some people react and said it was like a slap in the face of the recommendations which the commission had put before Honduras in relation to the matter. Please forgive me for my lack of use of our diplomatic language, but it's a matter for the women's uh, of apportorship, which is extremely serious. Uh, um, and extremely concerning because from my point of view as the Rapporteur of Women's Rights, it, this amendment is a death sentence against a lot of women in Honduras and a lot of children because so many children are violated sexually and become pregnant and they will die because either from not being able to hold the pregnancy safely or commit suicide or use unsafe abortion methods. This is, it is so blatantly clear 
to everybody and all the years that we have been talking about women's sexual reproductive health and rights, this has been made clear. That when there is a complete bar on access to abortion, conditionally, the three conditions were okay, not too bad, right? You are in fact impeding the life cycle of too many women. And I am very concerned because of the number of children who are sexualized forcibly and will be forced to carry pregnancies when they are still children. This is unacceptable in anywhere. And what happens to the men? I haven't heard anything about what happens to the men who violate these children who violate the women, what happens to them? What are the laws relating to them? How many of them are arrested, tried and, and convicted and sentenced? We know there's impunity in that regard. So why the haste to pass this law without giving access to the citizens to give their input as to how they feel about such a law on their law books. One has to ask ourselves that. Um, Madam um, Anna Madrid, I, you mentioned the fact of um, family planning methods, you're enhancing and trying to get uh, persons to use family planning methods. I do ask with all respect, what family um, planning methods are you referring to? Could you answer that specifically for us? Um, because that would be interesting since the after the pill is forbidden. Um, um, I, I do ask as well, if you could give definitive answer to the question of the impunity in relation to the men who violate the sanctity of the bodies of children in Honduras and those of women. It would be good if we can have numbers up to date about that, because we have uh, from the rapporteurship and the commission, we've spoken a great deal with Honduras. And I, I venture to end by saying, that in my humble opinion, this amendment is a clear violation of Honduras's uh, obligation under the international treaties which it has signed and from which it is re reneged. And I think Honduras as my learned brother has said, is always open to discussion and so on. That has been my, my uh, um, experience as well. And we trust that you will be open to discussion again about this so that Honduras can hold its head high. This is not the way to decrease the sexual, the high number of sexual violations that go on in the country. This is not the way. The way to do that is to ensure that your men act responsibly in a sexual manner. And I haven't heard anything about that. So um, I'm sorry that I sound so emotional, but it is an emotional subject for women and the rapporteurships for women. Gracias. So thank you very much. Gracias. Eh, le doy la palabra a la comisionada. Thank Semena. you. Now I would like to give the floor to Commissioner. Esmeralda Rosemena, Rapporteur for Children's Rights. Thank you, Madam President. We don't have much time, my uh, Commissioner, so I would like to greet all of you all together in order to make the most of my time. I would like to recognize the effort, your work, the commitment of the representatives of civil society and of the state and also the representative of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations. I would like to congratulate colleague 
and Commissioner Joel Hernandez. I think that he is the man in this room and his words are sound and consistent with what it means for the society of Honduras and for the state of Honduras, the need to have an analysis of the meaning of this reform. This absolute prohibition is a constitutional prohibition. Last month, we had the opportunity to meet with the authorities of Honduras, and this is the name that the reform received. But because of the time restrictions, I want to make emphasis on an idea. You have provided us with all the figures regarding the reality experienced by girls and adolescents, since they are the main victims of sexual abuse. They are the human group that receives in a disproportionate way with differentiated impacts in, on their lives. They had to deal with sexual violations and sometimes they get pregnant and therefore, because of that pregnancy, they have to face those limitations and those restrictions. There is complete and absolute. What the state needs to assess, in my humble opinion, is when we uh, here, the state saying we are trying to promote legislative uh, measure to stop uh, child marriage, but child marriage is important, but we have over 820 cases of sexual violations where of girls under 14 out of 20,000 cases. So those 800 girls were suffering sexual violation. Their lives, they have been victims. They are victims of your lack of protection because their projects of lives have been destroyed. We see a perpetuation of poverty. We see discrimination. We see inequality because these girls won't be able to go to school. So you need to understand what it means for a country, this situation, what a special protection of girls means. Sorry, Commissioner Julissa. You have just some seconds for the special rapporteur, the most understanding person of the commission. So you have the floor. I want just to greet all the people and to make emphasis on an idea. Together with all the international organizations, we, every international organization have make uh, recommendations and the San Salvador group also made recommendations in this regard in the report of 2017 and in the most re recent report of May 2021, precisely because it considered that this is a public health issue. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Soledad. But I have many comments, but I will make those comments when I conclude the hearing. So I would like to give the floor to civil society now. Can I speak on behalf of civil society? Good afternoon, everybody. I am on behalf of the civil society organizations that requested this thematic hearing. I don't see who else are here who are represented the state of Honduras, but I know that you mentioned the public prosecutor, and also the Under Secretary of Human Rights. I also see the minister with whom we have been able to have some uh, conversations. I see that Dr. Aldo is there. We have been able to uh, talk to her with regard to the emergency bill. I recall that at the beginning of 
2018, we sent them a letter because we were concerned because when we uh, prepare a report on the protocol of victims of sexual violence, we knew that the minister decided not to approve the protocol. She decided not to send the protocol to the minister or to the other ministers or authorities in order for it to be approved. And she denied uh, or she rejected to do so because it included a prevention of uh, teenage pregnancy. So since 2017, we presented the protocol before the secretary, the secretary of health, but it's still not approved. And I also want to say that the government has been in power since 2010. So in they have 11 years to derogate the ministerial agreement that prohibits contraception, but they have not derogate or eliminate it. And this Minister of Health decided not to receive us, not uh, even before the pandemic. I saw that Daisy Cheka was also there. The last time we saw each other was in 2018 when we had a high level forum. Uh, she is always with us. And in that occasion, she mentioned that there were 500 recommendations for Honduras by international organizations. But what concerns me is that you are open to international organizations, but you don't pay attention to civil society. So we have sent you over 700 recommendations. And this is not about including those platforms or in a, or including them in a platform or in a program. We want what we see in these 11 years, there is a pattern. You have denied us to have access to contraception, to education, to sexual education or to abortion in some circumstances. So we see that there is a pattern of violation of human rights, of reproductive and sexual rights of women and girls in Honduras. So you, the government and the state are answering many things, but they are not answering what we are asking them or what we are requesting them. So I just want to say that in the Universal Periodical Review, in this previous one and in the last one, uh, there is, um, issues related to territory and reproductive rights and also the rights of LGBTI persons. So I want to know what you say when you know that there are information regarding these three issues in that review. Thank you. Is anybody else going to say something from the civil society? Yes, I, it's an honor to be present. I am part of the some of Muta's platform. I would like to make some comments. We are quite shocked by the declarative statements of the state because it's just that a declaration because all the public policies and the intent uh, to, to carry out bills are still waiting. And as my colleague Regina was saying, they haven't shown since the Universal Periodical Review any advances, any progress until now. I would like to make reference to what the state has said as to the alliances with the civil society. Well, it calls my attention this declaration on the state because before the approval of this in constitutional reform that attempts against the right of, uh, of the reproductive rights of women and girls, it also was done 
by a great by uh, infringing a mechanism that that is established by law and this is a slap in the face for uh, against women and girls and this was not enough and this was done unequally unequally because some days before citing us in a very sudden way and without enough conditions so as to have a proper dialogue some days before they did met with all they did meet with all the religious stakeholders of our country and with several anti-rights uh, law uh, people and they had access to better conditions they were given a very high press coverage and they celebrated the fact of uh, the prohibition of the abort so we consider in the end that there that there are certain sound proof that show that our willingness to their willingness to view uh, to dialogue with the civil society it's not true because they have not had many intentions to have dialogue with the representatives of the states and we it, it was not possible for us they also talked about the process of the creation of the reform the approval of the reform and then the rectification of the reform and there was no declaration by the other branches of the state as to that and the Honduran states characterized itself by for violating human rights under the idea that the parts of the branches have uh, to comply with a separate function but we know that in a true democracy that's not true because they have to be coordinated so as to uh, warranty fundamental rights and we are happy that you're taken down by all of the, all these aspects and this opportunity now is in this legal body not not only to eliminate this reform that attempts against constitutional rights but to also to avoid this context of criminalization for women and rights thank you okay so is it over you can use the floor Uh, we cannot hear you, Erika. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I will be brief. I would like to remind you that two years ago, almost two years ago, we had a hearing similar to this one in Sucre. And I would like to remind you that all the notes that the Honduran state had taken down have not become true. I would like to say that the arguments are still the same in terms of the Congress, in terms of the executive, they are based and they are keep on creating laws out of the religious fundamentalisms based on that. And they want that their personal beliefs that are acceptable, but they allow them to legislate and to lead the life of a whole country. I would like to just say that the commission has dedicated has dedicated more time to discuss and to address the complexity of the abortion that the Congress itself, and this is an indicator of their lack of interest, of their um, willingness to take care of the life of women. I would like just to say that as to the emergency pill, I would like to give you an important message, which is the legal nature of the document that prohibits the emergency pill in Honduras, which is an, a, a ministerial agreement. So to derogate it is enough with a legislative action. I think it's very important to have a sound commitment if you are willing to work for the reproductive rights of women in Honduras. I think that would be a very important gesture and it would be a very good result or outcome of this hearing. Thank you. The civil society I will grant the floor to the state for 10 minutes. Facing the 
questions asked, the, minist the Ministry of the National Institute of Women will participate first. Thank you. As to the question regarding the contraception methods one, two, three, that are used, the inserted, the subdermic, the condoms that are the ones that are used by the CESAL, but I also mentioned that those were also, some of them were also mentioned in the Women's Center with, where there is a module to attend to the sexual and reproductive rights of women. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. As to what you said on the use of the emergency pill, which was forbidden in the country, it's true that we worked on that protocol against uh, women who are uh, for women who are victims of sexual violence. That protocol is quite complete and several institutions have been working in this topic. We have been working in this protocol, but one of the things that for which we could not pass that protocol is because there is a ministerial agreement, which is 2744 of the year 2009, in which the use and commercialization of the pill was prohibited. If you ask me as we, as women and as a practitioner I am, I agree with the use of the pill, but whereas, but, whenever there is that ministerial agreement is in force, we cannot include a protocol for the legal use, the, the use of the, of the emergency bill. So what, that was the only reason for which that protocol could not be approved. There are lots of technical opinions. We have get them to the different ministers in this government, and we have explained to them the importance of the use of the emergency pill in those people who are victims of sexual violence. But the Congress had put, placed the, the ball in the court of the Ministry of Health so that they are the entity that does away with that ministerial agreement. And we have had three ministers and they had not, and they were not willing to eliminate that uh, ministerial agreement. Once that ministerial agreement is eliminated, the use of the emergency pill will be legal in the country. We do know that it has been used illegally. There are certain instances, for instance, the organization Medicos Sin Frontera Without Borders have been supporting women. And I know that they have been distributing this pill. I am for the pill, but where if the Ministry of Health, who is in the Secretary of Health, if they don't make a determination as to this, we cannot pass this protocol. This is a political decision making. I know that there will be lots of people that will be against the use of the emergency pill, but in that protocol, we spoke about attending to this issue and to in could be and to include those women for the studies that they have to, the the medical studies that have to be performed on them when they are violated um to attend to them for um hiv and for the sexual illnesses and to treat them for those illnesses, but this aspect is not taken care of. As a doctor, I am sure that bringing a child to the world who is a product of a sexual violation is terrible for the child himself, but 
if the ministers do not do away with that ministerial agreement, we cannot do anything. We cannot approve that protocol. Thank you. Honorable members of the commission, out of what was exposed in this hearing, the Honduran states has has done important advances, but we keep on working, facing the pandemic and the destruction that uh, the hurricanes have caused upon us. We are aware that in order to go a step forward in this hearing, it's not only necessary to uh, raise awareness in the, society, in the society, but also to change cultural patterns so as to break antagonism, so as to achieve the uh, proposed objective. That is, all Hondurans can enjoy the fundamental rights and the rights of persons without any distinctions. We would like to thank you for your support and for and we would like to also thank for the organization to for the rights of women who are present in this hearing who fight every day for the inclusion of women in the society for I would also like to thank in the civil society for its contribution, we reiterate the commitment of the state of Honduras in the, in the compliance of national and international obligations. And it is in order to highlight that in those topics, such as the right to abortion and the protection of sexual and reproductive rights in a society such as ours, as it has been exposed, there are several challenges ahead of us. So we are going to achieve this objective gradually. We are open to dialogue. We are open to work in a coordinated manner without deviating from the respect of human rights. We had announced the Secretary of In Social Inclusion but we are going to have a written report by them because there is no time left and it is going to be sent by the representative of the secretary who is present here and if you would like to he can also address the prevention programs you still have two minutes if you want to use them you can use them okay attorney thank you Good morning, good afternoon. I just want to mention that through the Secretariat of Social Inclusion, which is in charge to promote programs and projects that uh, promote the rule of law, there are two programs that are very important. One is the prevention of pregnancy. And these programs are pro promoted by the first lady in order to comply with international treaties. The first program has to do with the prevention of teenage uh, pregnancy in order to guarantee the best quality of life for adolescents through an articulated and intersectorial response with a human rights approach uh, by trying to implement protections and measures of, to prevent teenage pregnancy and we also try to guarantee those tools in order for the adolescents to make uh, positive decisions regarding teenage pregnancy. Also, we have the program of uh, family improvement that is working together with the United Nations and under the, there is a strategy for adolescents in order to provide families with support especially not to leave anybody behind. And we have also a training workshop that is called Train the Trainers for adolescents uh, up to 19 years old in order to promote the prevention of teenage pregnancy. The pandemic has caused 
several negative effects on Honduras. And therefore, we develop a third strategy that is the Sistea system. It is an informative, an innovative system for adolescents. We maximize their technological skills and we consider three main components in this program. Please uh, wrap up because we are running out of, time, out of time. So one of those is a tool to prevent teenage pregnancy. Then the Inclusion Social Secretariat tries to support all the measures. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but we are closing today's hearing. I have several comments. I have not been able to do them so far. So I would like to thank the civil society for being here today, but also for their constant work. I know that there are a lot of women, girls and adolescents that are following this hearing. I also would like to thank the state of Honduras for being here. I would like to mention some things. First, the principle of unity of a state, the international responsibility of a state is for the state as a whole, in spite of a ministry saying something or the judiciary saying something different. And this is something that is not limited to the judiciary, but also covers any authority. Uh, they cannot enforce regulations that go against international obligations and treaties. And the court has said this several times, the Convention of the Para, uh, Belén do Pará is part of the Corpus Juris, and the Convention establishes the obligation of adapting everything that has to do with cultural, economic, religious, or uh, um, characteristics or measures in order if they violate uh, the human rights of women. And also the advisory opinion 26 says that the principle of equality and non-discrimination is a Jews cogent uh, norm. And the lack of access to the emergency pill and to the interruption of pregnancy in some conditions also has a negative impact. I also would like to thank the presence of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, because it's important to remember the relationship between international organizations. The OACHR established, uh, established um, some years ago a statement regarding the right to life by saying that those countries that are absolute prohibit abortion are not only denying human rights of women, they are all, this also leads to clandestine abortions, and that is a violation of the right to life. And also would like to recall the principles of human rights that include the non-regressiveness principle, that you cannot go back in the recognition of rights. And in the framework of the corpus juris, I would like also to recall how the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Committee of the United Nations also addresses the rights of women and girls to have access to sexual and reproductive health in a differentiated way. Also, we have recommendation 35 of the CEDAW committee that says that by prohibiting violence against women because of gender reasons constitutes a norm of uh, constituting a law. I also would like to recall the importance of the essential obligation or the Inter-American system, the American Convention that establishes in Article 2 the obligation of adapting internal or domestic regulations in order to comply with the duty uh, of states in the framework of equality and non-discrimination. The situation is terrible. And if we think about the pandemic, as a reporter said, in some time because women and girls cannot leave their houses and they are subject to sexual violence. We are in a very serious situation. I just want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, also the high commissioner, the commissioners, and I would like to close the hearing this way. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you.